When I ranked every zombies game, to the dismay of many, I put Infinite Warfare Zombies above Black Ops and Black Ops 2 Zombies. Out of the 11 versions of Call of Duty Zombies, Infinite Warfare is my second favourite right behind Black Ops 3. Now of course, this is my own opinion, for Infinite Warfare Zombies fits my taste like a glove. But anyone who's watched my videos knows I prodigiously enjoy all zombies, except Vanguard. So what's so special about Infinite Warfare Zombies? Well in this video we are going to delve further into a game that I feel not many even gave a chance. I've already made a video beating every boss in the game, these bosses are so creative, difficult and most importantly epic that they are the centerpiece of fun. However there is another side, the core root of zombies, surviving for as long as possible. And it's clear this hasn't been truly tested like some other zombies. Round 100 alone was able to propel me to 20th in the world. So in this video, we explore Infinite Warfare Zombies by starting out on round 1 with a pistol and using our environment, whether that be magical or mechanical, to defeat 100 rounds of increasing zombies. And well, these maps host more secrets than I could ever know. Each map is incredibly unique from another, and overall this journey was a blast. Zombies in Spaceland, the second greatest map of all time, in my own opinion. This map on the surface is an absolute blast, but if you do delve deeper, you realise the attention to detail is quite astonishing and the limits, well, quite unlimited. I've beaten 100 rounds of zombies within this theme park once before and in doing so broke a world record. However, it's been two years since and my record has been absolutely shattered by far better players. So, can I reclaim the throne? And in doing so, what other dark secrets shall I learn about this alien theme park? Now, first, I must state, when you do beat Mephistopheles, the final boss in Infinite Warfare Zombies and the hardest boss in Zombies history, you unlock the Director's Cut, where you spawn in with all perks and $25,000 cash. You also unlock Willard Wyler, the director of these movies that we play in. Unfortunately, you have to have the Director's Cut on to play as Willard Wyler. So in getting to round 100, I couldn't use the character nor his wicked dagger. This led me to a crossroads, and so I decided to do a zero kill round 100 challenge using the alligator head and running around with his dagger that does give you advanced speed. However, there was an issue, the brutes. There is no way to kill them without it counting as an elimination. I did try a glitch to paralyze them, but this didn't work either, as one paralyzed brute would spawn another active one. So I decided to do dagger and trap only, but again, the brutes got in the way. The dagger does harm them, but it's very ineffective. So in the end, I set out to beat this new world record. There are five different characters you can play as. All teen movie character tropes, except one. You have the nerd, the valley girl, the jock, David Hasselhoff, and then the rapper, the character I play as in this run. Usually zombies takes place in rundown, war-torn, or even Lovecraftian settings, and I love all of these. However, being set in a weird, colourful, and artistic theme park is just fantastic to me. It's a nice change of pace into a weird and bizarre world. So, to get round 100 and fast, I grab the M1 Grand, put a mysterious core on it, pack a punch it, which allows me to place a violent, mysterious wind from a small UFO onto my gun, thus doing more damage whilst also stunning the zombies, which is very important. With all this, I can get through the first 35 rounds simply shooting my weapon. But at this stage, a change is needed. My gun has gotten weak, and so I buy some cryo-freeze grenades and a rewind grenade. Cryo-freeze grenades firstly stops the advance of zombies, then secondly makes them all incredibly weak. It also regenerates over time. The rewind grenade saves your life in a pinch and in style. These two grenades paired with the alligator trap enables you to go far whilst being fast. Now, I will not say this is perfect. I made mistakes and sometimes I feel the game made mistakes. But with some confident movement as it seems the zombies kind of allow you to run through them on this game, you will easily reach round 100 and have a blast doing so. Also, the brutes are so easily erased with the M1 Grand that it kind of feels like cheating. The clowns are a novelty and a blessing for they are no threat and a joy to pop. I enjoy zombies in Spaceland a lot. This round 100 is so much fun and the easter egg is incredible. But on top of this, every time I play, it seems I learn 10 new things about the map. I love theme parks and it really would be incredible to go to Spaceland. Barring the zombies, of course.
But wait, did I beat the world record? Well, not even close. But anyway, we have four more maps to go. Rave in the Redwoods. Now this might be the coziest zombies map I've ever played. It elicits the same comforting feelings of covering yourself in a blanket with a bunch of candy to watch your favorite horror movie. On the surface, this map is Friday the 13th. It takes place at a summer camp, and when you start to trip bowls, as after all, this map does take place after a rave has been savagely overrun by zombies, a masked slasher hunts you down. And even the final boss drowns, just like Jason, to be reborn a monster. But there's more to this map, of course. There are four magic bows, hordes of big feet, helium balloon traps, and if all that doesn't work, there's also the wood chipper. Again, a joyous rave has just been ravenously picked apart. So we must look the part to survive the aftermath. The rapper becomes a grunge rocker, the valley girl a west side gangster, the jock a hip hop wannabe, the hoff is now substituted with Kevin Smith, and the nerd becomes the candy raver. Genuinely, his aesthetic and vibe is one of my favorite in all of zombies. I particularly enjoy slapping zombies to death using a glow stick. Also, just to clarify, in rave culture, the candy raver is someone who trades certain items called candy as a sign of peace, love, unity, and respect. So how in this peaceful state do we go from bare-handed pacifists to destroying 100 rounds of zombies? Most of which were just dancing at this rave moments ago. Well, first, it all starts with a golf club. Now, this map is notoriously easy. However, I have definitely played easier maps. In fact, I struggled on this map far more than any other in this video. Failing at round 96 is always demoralizing. However, this map is so much fun, I wasn't hesitant to boot up the next game. But in all honesty, this map is actually pretty damn easy, if you just take it slow. There are three important steps to this round 100. Firstly, and the most ridiculous and overpowered, is to activate this rewind challenge station, which gives you a challenge of meleeing 15 zombies. As a reward, you get a free rewind grenade every two rounds, which is possibly the most unbalanced challenge ever. It's so simple, yet so absurdly overpowered, as not only does the rewind grenade save you in a pinch, but it also refills all arrows in your magical bows. This makes a massive difference. Speaking of, the bows are the next step. They are also ridiculously easy to get and upgrade. You just need to build an engine for the boat, travel to the island, where Kevin Smith is hiding, and whilst here in this cabin, pick up a sausage from a bucket. And then swallow some ecstasy, essentially. This enters you into rave mode, and in this state of imagination, you have to throw sausages at three deer heads. With this done, you can pick up the ordinary crossbow. I should note at this point, reality may be completely deluded after whatever drugs we just consumed, so it does make sense from our own hallucinogenic point of view that if we place these statues next to their given totem poles and feed them with zombie souls, we get magical bows. There are four different bows, which gets me to the next step. You need mule kick to carry three of them. Not a very hard map, as I've already stated. Also, have I mentioned you can get a pacifier on your gun? Well, never mind, we will keep that for another video. The magical bows we will be abusing to reach round 100 are the acid rain, wind, and trapomatic bows. I did not use the thunder bow. The strategy is very simple and easy. Shoot the wind bow in this direction as it has a massive radius, and it is also just very strange. That's why in the strategy, you run forward and then rain acid on the dance floor, right in the center of the pulling zombies. And that is it. You just repeat this process over and over and over. It's ridiculously fast, and with the help of the rewind grenades that you get every second round, you can keep doing this to around 80. Then you do have to be a bit more frugal with your ammo, and you have to start to implement the slower bow. This is very necessary, as in prior attempts, I kept rushing everything, and in turn, kept running out of arrows, and thus turning to bizarre ways of killing zombies. Slow and bizarre, I might add. Sometimes I even used a lawnmower. But even when conserving arrows, there is a chance you can just run out, and this is when your knife throwing skills are going to be put to the test. If you go to this zombie tied to a wheel and activate the challenge, it will cause him to spin. You have an opportunity here to get a max ammo. 
you have to hit the head of the zombie five times in a row, which is not as easy as it looks, especially because you only have one single chance for perfection each round. And even then, if you complete the circus trick, a lot of the time you aren't rewarded with a max ammo. It's really bizarre. And don't ask me why, because I'm just as confused. But with all this said, the nerdy pacifist Raver defeats 100 waves of the undead. I really enjoyed Raven the Redwoods, and I hope this confirms why I like Infinite Warfare Zombies so much. The themes on the maps are so brilliantly done, but the gameplay is also really fun. I really do enjoy this game, and speaking of enjoying things, we are now moving on to Shaolin Shuffle. Taking place in a rundown Staten Island in New York, the city has literally just been taken over by rats. Through the symbiosis with a formerly successful businessman who's just been caught embezzling money. The rage within this rat thing and the addition of zombies throws the city into despair, leaving only the fellow human vermin left surviving and also Pam Greer. This rat king has taken over the city, but his existence is actually the main reason we can defeat 100 waves of zombies. Let me explain. You see, in his despair, he drank a vial, which for some reason attracted the rats, making him into a kind of rat man, as opposed to the conventional Spider-Man. Whatever was in the vial was very powerful, as his heart is grotesquely powerful. When squished, any nearby zombies are filled with rats, thus exploding from within as the rats scatter outwards. Although his heart isn't very splendiferous, it does recharge over time, making it one of the best weapons in all of zombies. Did I forget to mention it does infinite damage also? I mean seriously, this heart on any zombies map will allow you to easily get to round 100. That's why I think they added one of the hardest enemies in zombies to counter it. The ninja zombies. Now these guys are infamous, we all know them, and despise them. Now alone they just do a lot of damage per kung fu move, but that's not the only reason they're so deadly. The main reason is the fact that whenever you sprint, they spawn right in front of you, making them unavoidable. And on top of this, they can send you up towards the moon. This was not my footage, but from your boy Badger. Shout out to him, he actually did this before me. It's very lucky then that we can build a toy robot, a lava lamp, and a couple bottles of zombie gone to help us out. Well, there's just one thing. They all pretty much kind of suck. Zombie Gorn is genuinely useless. It's meant to stop the zombies from entering a tiny area, but it lasts about two seconds and is absolutely pointless when trapped. The lava lamp is a little better. It has a timer on its side, and once it rings, the lamp explodes and the lava kills any zombies that run over it. It doesn't last very long, so it's really not that effective. Finally, we have the toy soldier, which is actually pretty damn epic and cool. It's very helpful and strong in the early rounds, but practically useless later on. But you know what doesn't suck and essentially has infinite ammo? A katana. And this precisely is why Shaolin Shuffle is also one of my favorite maps ever. It's very hard, but we're given an all-powerful heart and a katana that releases the spirit of a tiger. In all seriousness though, this map on the surface is actually really hard. I'm just glad the community is very clever. But wait, we're no longer at a rave in a summer camp, so surely we must fit in to play the part. From jock to hip hop wannabe to now a sleaze bag, AJ really has had a rough run of characters. The girl is now a disco chick, the nerd a punk rocker, the rapper the street poet, and our celebrity is Pam Greer. Speaking of, she's the one who guides us through the map to take down the Rat King. As yes, you have to beat the easter egg to obtain the heart. Thankfully the final boss fight isn't compulsory, but you have to do every single step up to it. I can't state enough how long this process is. However, I did fail quite a few times and I actually quite enjoyed rebooting up the map and completing these absolutely illogically connected steps that eventually allow you to summon the Rat King for the third time to steal his heart. At this stage, I should have enough points to buy the katana for $10,000 cash and pack a punch it. I should note this area of Staten Island is incredibly sleazy and downtrodden, and I kind of love it. At first, the katana is just a blast to use. It's a one strike kill and the dragon devours anything in its way, but you only have 20 spirits to conjure up through your sword. So it's best to retreat up to this roof and drop down onto the club sign. 
Up here, the zombies can only come from below or spawn to the side. Now, the only thing that makes it remotely possible to survive up here past round 40 is the fact that the sword kind of glitches out. About round 35 plus, the sword is no longer a one strike kill. And with its natural low ammo, it's not very effective. However, if you hit two or more zombies at once, all zombies on the sign will die. And as the rounds progress, this for some reason gets more and more overpowered until eventually the sword completely glitches out and just kills any zombie that jumps or spawns on the sign. This usually happens at around 60 plus and you can pretty much just go AFK from here. Now, this strategy is of course insanely easy and quite satisfying, but during the 50s, it can be slightly awkward leading to some pretty sketchy moments as the sword is just very predictable and it works different from round 40 to round 50 to round 60. But there is one thing you can easily predict with this strategy. Your game will crash past round 70. I mean, it only makes sense. Look how hard this sword is working to kill all the zombies. And so now the real skill begins. We have to train in the sewer with the heart and the katana. But even these two alone aren't powerful enough to reach round 100 from here on out. We have to bring in the big boy, the titan. Now, if you didn't know, you can double pack a punch on this map very easily. By pressing on this button and exiting, taking this portal and collecting these bulbs, placing them in this electricity and waiting for a train to run them over. And then adding these bulbs to the Pack-A-Punch machine, we can double Pack-A-Punch. And thus the katana goes from this to this. However, a normal gun is different, especially the Titan. For some reason, and honestly I'm not sure why, when you Pack-A-Punch this light machine gun, you walk and sprint faster than any other weapon. I think it's the equivalent speed as Willard Wyler's knife. In fact, it might even be faster. This speed is very important for the strategy, as the ninja zombies will otherwise slap you to bits. So this strategy, which is very hard and quite scary, is to firstly hit the trap whenever it's available. This kills the zombies very quickly and of course effectively, whilst giving you a momentary breather. Now the real fun begins. Shoot the sword spirit and immediately swing twice to recharge it. Then whip out the titan to prevent being killed, abusing the speed boost. Once a small group of zombies has gathered, use the Rat King's heart, and then boom, we use the sword again. Making sure to be quick with all these weapons as to ensure not too many ninjas are allowed to spawn in on the map at one time. Also, it's very important to never go to the outside edges of the sewer, because the ninjas usually spawn there and will hit you no matter what you do. But this is truly not the hardest part. Now, I mentioned earlier that the katana practically has infinite ammo. And this is true because you can always buy and upgrade a new one without ever losing cash in the long run. An infinite ammo wonder weapon is a very dangerous thing. However, to reach the katana is the trickiest thing of all. Usually, I would just sprint with the heart out and pray I wasn't murdered by a ninja. However, the best strategy is definitely to walk slowly, as the ninjas won't surprise spawn in front of you this way. However, when you reach the dojo, there really isn't much you can do from here, as the zombies and ninjas seem to be just everywhere. This proved getting a new katana very hard and risky. So sometimes when out of ammo and not in a rush, I would simply just use the infinite rat hard. I would do this until it was the end of the round and then get a fresh katana without the risk. And with all this said and done, the sleaze bag reaches round 100 in his natural habitat, a sleazy, rundown part of the city. Attack of the Radioactive Thing I distinctly remember after beating this epic boss a few years ago thinking, wow, that map was definitely an experience. But how in the world would one go about reaching round 100? I remember wanting to make this video right then, but something about this map just didn't seem like it was possible. At that stage, there was still a lack of knowledge on how the map's scientific devices worked, which is quite ironic considering the setting. Speaking of, again, the setting and theme of this map are so damn good. And the gameplay, personally, I found fun, even if some people despise this high round strategy. But I'll get into why I think it's fun when I go over the strategy. First, I want to set out what we are really doing here. A bunch of American nuclear testing has just taken place on the beach, causing many mutations to form specifically with the frogs in the region. However, we have one thing on our side, the science we used to cause this mess in the first place. 
There are four teleporters around the map. A weird scientific wonder weapon that uses the radioactive goo caused by the nuclear experiments to fill its ammo infinitely. Hence the name Modular Atomic Disintegrator. But additionally, the most important of these scientific breakthroughs are the four deployable devices. The Seismic Wave Generator, the Hypnosis Device, the Mind Control Device, and most important of all, the Violet Ray Device. I should also note Elvira does help us against the zombies as long as we do a few things for her, such as finding her spellbook and filling up a vial with mutated frog goo via a knife from a shark. So there is some magic to the scientific method. Again, we must become one with the theme of the map. Here we've changed into a rebel, a schoolgirl, a soldier, and a scientist. You can also play as Elvira herself. To defeat 100 waves of zombies and frogs, we firstly start in the contamination tent, where I purposely leave this door closed for the entirety of the game. Leaving the tent through the other exit leads me right towards one of the most important guns in Infinite Warfare Zombies, the UDM, which only costs $750 and is a simple full auto pistol that doesn't do much damage. So what the hell am I talking about? Well, there's another aspect of this game, almost sort of hidden, that in my opinion, I think is great. There is a way to upgrade this UDM to one of the best guns in the game, the Quartermaster. Now, I need to make this clear. I'm not a fan of weapon variants and pay to win in multiplayer. However, in Zombies, I actually quite like this addition. You definitely don't have to pay real money to obtain any of these things. Just simply by playing the game and collecting keys, you will earn enough salvage, which will allow you to buy the weapons. So from a zombie's point of view, it's kind of like leveling up to upgrade your weapons, which adds a lot more content and variability into the gameplay and also just makes it more fun in my opinion. This meek pistol goes from pretty much useless to an absolute beast. It essentially becomes a semi-automatic sniper that has a built-in lesser form of aimbot. If you just shoot in a zombie's direction, it will hit it and with a punch. This epic stalker variant of the weapon can be used for the first 45 rounds. This map is actually very simple when setting up. All you need to do is activate Pack-a-Punch and get the bulbs for double Pack-a-Punch. Get the wonder weapon from the magic will and build the violet ray device. Lastly, before the main strategy can begin, you need C4, which is very easy to get on this map, as zombies often drop them. At the end of a round, throw the C4 on these two zombie spawns. And then at the start of a new round, you will get two new C4, and so throw them down on these two other spawn locations. At this stage, you're meant to down yourself, and so I did. And so now that I've respawned, I can't destroy the C4, and no zombies will spawn near those C4 locations it's essentially blocking spawns. This means that with the door I left closed, no zombies will spawn around the contamination tent. Zombies can only come from this direction here. You sacrifice one of your four lives for a direct and easily controlled funnel of zombies. In the game I got round 100, I started to use the Violet Ray device in this little tunnel exit here at around wave 35. The way this strategy works is you continually drop and pick up the Violet Ray device. The device doesn't last long at all normally, but there's a way to make it last forever. I don't know the exact science and trust me, it's not as easy as it looks, nor as boring. So from what I've gathered, if you hold the Violet Ray device longer than you have it placed down on the ground, it will last forever. That's the maths. I think. By holding it, I think it slowly recharges the time it can be placed down for. So when placing it down, you pick it up almost immediately, like 0.1 of a second, to the point where you're constantly recharging it. For my first attempts, I kept breaking the device as there is a weird kind of difficulty to this. I heard it was easier on controller, so I did actually play a few games on controller, and it definitely was easier to control and make it more efficient. However, the hard part that, to be honest, isn't that hard, are the frogs. When they come, you have to place the device back on the ground quickly to allow yourself 
to one-shot them with the MAD. And if the super frogs come, it takes just a few more shots, but it's the same process. So the best way I found in controlling the device with utter control and fluidity was to change my keybinds. Right click picked up the device, left click placed it down. Now I get it, on the surface this looks really boring, but I don't know man, it kind of feels like playing Plants vs Zombies, and I loved that game. Also, like I said, the device is slightly difficult to master, and so if you do manage to break it and you don't have a backup, you have to use the four different traps around the map in tandem with the teleporters to get through the rounds, which puts a lot more pressure on your ability to control the ray device as the trap strategy is painstakingly slow and very hard. But that is how I made it to round 100 on attack of the radioactive thing. A map that I loved immediately for the easter egg and aesthetic. However, I originally thought the gameplay was kind of barren, stripped of any usual fun gameplay. Outside of the easter egg, of course. But now, I kind of have a massive soft spot for this map that I never had before. Beast from Beyond. Now, this is the map that stops Infinite Warfare Zombies from being a 10 out of 10 for me. Its saving grace is the epic boss fight with Mephistopheles, which I might add is a very strong saving grace. I also enjoy the preliminary boss fight too. If you didn't know, this map is a rewrite of Nightfall, the extinction map. However, Nightfall took place on Earth, and Beast takes place on this really cool unknown planet. This map does have a very similar vibe to the campaign, which I recently beat and thought was just okay. The coolest thing about it was definitely the scenic views of the planets. This map takes place in a military outpost that has been overrun by zombies and aliens. However, for some reason they made it so the zombies only spawn in when you place Neil's head into the computer, thus restoring power to the station. To be frank, this is a very odd map. I don't mind the theme, but compared to the other four, it's nowhere near as good. And there's very good reason for this. Lee Ross, the associate project director for Infinite Warfare Zombies, stated on Twitter, the map got very limited support due to the studio wanting to move on. What we were able to ship was quite impressive given the limited timeline and resources. This map's work also contains all of the director's cut work for the super easter egg. He goes on in another reply, we wanted to include an extinction boss and early discussions had both the breeder and the ancestor involved, but time and resources were the worst enemies. I have full confidence that if the studio gave more resources and more time to the project, this map would have been amazing. It would have been so sick to fight an ancestor on this game, and I feel like the connection between Extinction and Infinite Warfare Zombies would have been bridged much better. Because to be honest, the way it finished, it just feels bizarre. This map definitely has so much potential to be more, but unfortunately it isn't, and thus it's a sad ending to an otherwise amazing game. So what about killing 100 waves of aliens and zombies? Well, for this map, I decided to do something a little different than I normally do. I did it once before in my beating all extinction maps video, so I thought I'd do it again in the same vein. I went all out. I ran director's cut, I used any fate and fortune cards I wanted, as I never use mega gobblegums, or fortune cards in my videos. I must admit another reason I did this. The normal round 100 strategy is so damn boring, and although I've never tried it, I'd imagine it's quite difficult. It takes around 13 hours to reach round 100, and it usually involves the Venom Z, a laser trap, and the Entangler. Genuinely, congrats to anyone who's accomplished this round 100. The way I got to round 100 instead is one of the most unique in all of zombies. If I can even call it zombies. Because this way, you only have to face the aliens. Remember, if you don't place Neil's head into the computer, the zombies never spawn in. Now, I tried to do this without the director's cut, but the aliens are way too strong. Without Neil's head in the computer, there is no power, which means no perks. But of course, if you already spawn in with all the perks in the game, you don't have to worry about the power. This just leaves two things you do have to worry about. Pack-a-Punch and the Magic Will. Well, firstly, the Magic Will works without turning on the power. And secondly, without the director's cut, every gun you get from the Magic Will is already pack a punch. Seriously, what a bloody amazing super easter egg. First, you have an epic boss fight, and then you're rewarded with something truly overpowered. Something that lives up to the difficulty of the boss fight. But even this isn't quite enough, as the cryptids are surprisingly strong. 
I need to use some of these fortune cards that I've been keeping around for a rainy day. Firstly, I activate Packing Heat, which gives me a random double Pack-a-Punch weapon. Pretty damn good card. I got the Spaz 12, which I was very happy about. The next card I used was the Packing Magic card. Now this one is very important. It grants the next weapon I pick up from the wheel an upgrade. Because I'm playing on Director's Cut, the gun is already Pack-a-Punch once, so Pack Magic upgrades it again, making it double Pack-a-Punch, and thus the Venom Z. The Venom Z is a lot better than the Venom Y. I then activated my third card, Get Packed, which will Pack-a-Punch my next wall buy. So I grabbed the Carmel 45, which is right next to our camping spot. And then honestly, from this point on, this was probably the easiest round 100 I've ever done. The alien's health barely increases past round 20, and the amount that spawn also barely increases full stop. So round 30 is the same difficulty and the same speed as round 100, and even round 300 for that matter. This map is by far my least favorite, and it's sad to think what could have been. See ya.